Like I mentioned, people that come to the seminars and so forth come from all different persuasions. Uh, a lot of people come in from the different points of view in regards to, to the law, the equity, and all those kinds of things. Uh, most of the things we'll talk about have to do with the admiralty side of uh, the situation. And, uh, but let me emphasize from the start, and that is, <clears throat> why do you rely upon someone else's law for them? Why don't you have your own law? That's a good question you should ask yourselves. Uh, if you are relying upon someone else's uh, uh, system of law, then you fall under that jurisdiction. And so what I'm going to explain to you, and as we go along through the seminar this weekend and so forth, I think it should become obvious to you that you can, you can create your own law forum that you can actually avoid all these other things by simply filling up your world with your law and preventing anybody else from coming into it with their law. Now that might seem like a pretty big, pretty big statement at the first, but eventually I think you'll see what that is. Uh oh, got a question already? You betcha. Okay, um, you betcha. Well, it's not so much a question as a statement of what you just said. You're sort of asked it's a question, so I'm going to give you an answer. I think okay. there's a lot of people out there have so, well, why don't we use our own law? Well, when somebody sticks his gun in your face and, or you know, starts to arm wrestle you and says, this is my law and I'm forcing you under my law, it's kind of hard to say, hey, just a minute, I got my own laws here. <laughs> well, they'll do it one time and they won't ever do it again. Because after we get done with them, they won't want to do it again. Now, that's one of the things... Uh, in the communities and in the jurisdictions and so forth that you're operating in, uh, how, do, how does the court and how does the, the community perceive you? Are you a rabble-rouser, an arguer, uh, all that kind of stuff? Probably that's how you perceive you. And so what you want to do, though, is establish yourself where you're at so that everybody knows what it is. Now, back in ancient times, when the people used to build big, great big huge walls around their cities, they used to post their law on the gate of the city so that everybody going in or coming back out understood exactly how they were to conduct themselves. Now, <clears throat> when, when somebody comes to your house, don't you expect them to obey the house rules? When you go to somebody else's house, don't you expect that you'll obey their house rules? It's only common courtesy. And so I think in your communities and so forth, once you have established yourself and given them notice that this is who I am and this is what I'm doing, then I think perhaps you might be able to get the respect that you're looking for in regards to your law. Now, one of the things that we're going to show in, uh, during this weekend is how to properly move from your private law and still be able to interface with their public law. And you can do that thing, it's not a problem. The only thing you have to remember when you do that is, is when you come out of your private over here into their public, you gotta bring a bond with you because you can't go over there to their house and cause uh, problems. You may not cause problems, generally people do, but you may not cause problems, but in the event that you cause a problem while you're over there, then they have a guarantee that you will satisfy the problem. Now that, that is perhaps the biggest uh, uh, draw, or not I shouldn't say drawback, but uh, the biggest problem most folks seem to have had in regards to the relationship they have with what's called the public. And so the public officer that sees you over there in his world uh, doing something that against their law, they say, well, you know, point the gun and say, stop doing that. Because what, you might, what you're doing there might, in fact, injure somebody in their world. And so you got to get things lined up before you go over there. And so that's, that's uh, pretty much a process we've been trying to uh, develop is so that, that you can go into their world successfully and not, not have the problems. Now, a as an example, I, I was talking to a fella, and he said that he had gone and uh, 
into a bank, a commercial bank. And he went to the bank and talked to the banker there. The banker said, told him right flat out, said, I have 35 years experience in the bank. I know everything there is to know about banking. He said, great. He said, here's what I want for you to do. I want you to do this and this and this and this. The banker said, no. <laughs> he looked at the banker and said, well, if you don't do this, 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 and this, you're breaking this law, this law, this law, and this law. And the banker said, I don't care. He said, I have a bond. The banker knew that they could operate however they wanted to operate in their world because they had a bond that would cause no injury or no kind of damage. And the banker said, and besides that, I have a whole room full of attorneys over here. So the, the thing that I learned from that was that if you're going to operate in that world over there, then you have to have a bond because if you're going to break some of the rules, quote unquote, then you better be prepared for it. Now, as we start talking about the accrual accounting and so forth, I think it'll become more apparent to you. We talked a little bit about that last night, and I think as we go over it again today, you'll get, kind of get a drift of how the thing works. Now, there's a couple of things uh, that would be most helpful to you uh, to start to differentiate, and that is you have you got it, you got to put it in your mind that there's a private world and there's a public world. You got to put it in your mind that there that there is money of exchange and there's money of account. You got to get it into your mind that uh, that there's asset accounting and there's accrual accounting. And so, so those things have to become fixed in your mind because when you're in one world or the other, things are different. And, and when you try to mix and match the two things together, there's where you run into the problems. Now, we talked a little bit last night about the concept of conversion. And it had to do with, uh, let's say, conversion of money. And that is, in the private world, we deal with money of exchange. When we, do, when we do stuff in the private world, we do something for something. I do something for him in exchange for something. And so in, in, in the public world, it's different. We don't do something for something. We simply keep the books on the transactions. That's all that happens. And so in, in, the, in the public world over here, the only consideration that, that is given is whether or not the books are correct. Now again, what demonstrates in the public that the books are correct? Zero. Zero balance. When the auditors look at your books over here in the public, the only thing they want to see is that big goose egg down at the bottom. If they can't find a big goose egg, they know there is a problem. So they go looking for the problem, and generally <laughs> they find something which you're not happy they found. But in any event, <clears throat> the reason why in the public it's that way is because the public is operating in, under admiralty law. They're operating with law of merchant law. And the only way under that system to determine whether or not there is fairness is to look at the books. They have to be able to look at the books. And that's why in the public, you are required to keep records. And the main problem you have to keep records is, is because you haven't learned how to do set off yet. <laughs> and so the contracts that you're involved in in the public never close escrow. They have to keep the books open. They cannot execute a contract in the public because you're not doing set-off. Mostly you're doing discharge, as we've been talking about here a minute ago. So we'll go over, that, we'll go over all those things as we kind of go along here. We're kind of getting warmed up to see which direction we're going to go. <clears throat> the information we uh, talked about last night, some of it I would like to go back over with you so that you understand exactly what it is that we're involved in here. Like I mentioned, there are, there are two remedies that are spoken of. One of those remedies is discharge, and the other remedy is set off. Now discharge, okay, come in.
Uh, you just mentioned that, uh, at least that's what I heard, that accrual accounting comes under private and asset no. accounting comes under public. No, this is the other way. Well, that's what I thought was wrong. Okay. That's what I heard you say, though. Well, your notes are wrong. Correct your record. <laughs> <laughs> It's called, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to write a statement up here. Stop and correct. So if I, if I catch somebody here writing things down wrong or something, I'm going to just point to it. Stop and correct. But in any event, the thing we were talking about, the two different remedies that are available to you in the public is number one is discharge. Now discharge always points to the future. It points to a future event. <clears throat> In the United States, and probably here too, I don't know the name, exact name of your uh, laws and so forth, but 1933, when the government took substance out of commerce for use. They came back out with a uh, bill which was known as HGR 192, House Joint Resolution 192 of, what was it, June the 5th, 1933. Anyway, at that juncture in history, everything changed. Everything changed. And so it became impossible under that system to pay a debt. As a matter of fact, it is against public policy to pay a debt. Now, what that did, what HDR 192 did in, in actuality was it obliterated common law. Common law is based on substance. This, is a ba this here is based on accrual accounting. So they obliterated the common law when they made it impossible to pay a contract. Now remember, a contract does not exist where it's made. Contract exists where it is paid. Let me write that up here. <laughs> Contract. I'll put made here. Put a big circle around it. Put it there. The contract exists where it's paid. And in consequence of that, when the government made it impossible to pay a debt, then it became a very hard thing to execute a contract. And in consequence of that, basically they obliterated common law when they're involved in anything that requires a remedy of payment. Now there are, are other common law things going on, but in regards to the payment of contracts, it pretty much just blasted the whole thing right out, right out the window. And so, the the remedy that was left, that was given by the government, was the opportunity to, to discharge a public, now remember what I'm saying here, discharge a public debt into the future. Now the reason why they could do that was because a corporation, there was a corporation at that time, and it's still around, Hmm. Can't even write it out here. There was a corporation known as the United States that said, "We will accept the liability. Well, we'll accept limited liability on the debt of all the citizens. The United States, and probably where you're at, be Canada or wherever." But the government said, we will accept limited liability of the debts of all the citizens. And so they became what's known by definition 
as the constitutor, which meant they accepted the liability for the debts. So, in the public, when you discharge a debt, the United States is the future event. They promised to pay. When HGR 192 goes away. In other words, when substance comes back into use in commerce, the United States promises to pay. Now, folks, what are the chances <laughs> <laughs> of that happening? It ain't going to happen. Matter of fact, the United States has fled. That corporation has fled. You know, first off, the United States is a corporation out of Puerto Rico. Yeah. You knew that, didn't you? All right. Now, they're fixing to leave Puerto Rico and go to Costa Rica. But the corporation they left in its stead is, y'all know this one, it's Homeland Security. That's the new corporation that took over for the United States. And so the liability for Constitutor had now fallen upon Homeland Security. And the guys who understand all this kind of stuff tell me this, this probably won't last very long said so it's poorly put together. So they don't think this is going to last very long. And so I don't, know what, I don't know what the future holds for the corporations that are running North America and so forth. But it doesn't, look like they're going, it doesn't look like they have done a very good job and the prospects of them doing a very good job don't seem very likely either. Yes, sir. Good morning, Winston. Um, I mentioned yesterday I have tons of questions I'd love to be able to ask you, but <laughs> in the name of trying to stay within the... Uh, and we've got a lot of guys up here with knives and guns, so be careful. Yeah. <laughs> trying to stay within the theme of where you're going. I just thought I'd take the opportunity to ask one that does kind of fall in line with this. Uh -huh. You mentioned Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of us know what happened in January of this year. Um, with the new requirements for crossing the border. Uh -huh. And I'm curious, as many other people may be as well, um, what kind of scenario happened at the border for you coming up here? And did it involve a passport or, did. or anything like I that? I use passports. You do? Okay. So you don't recommend other people trying to I'm not do away with such anything. things? I'm not recommending you do anything. But uh, the whole object of the seminars, the presentations that were given, it's to teach you not how to fight, but to teach you how to utilize what's there for you. Now, if you properly negotiate or properly navigate on the seas of commerce, then it, uh, a passport is not a stumbling block. And so it's not, uh, I don't fear those kind of things, I control them. And so when I'm in control of the thing, it, it presents no danger to me. So that's why I've been kind of getting people into the notion of, is that you can, you can create your own world and you can control the things that are around you. You have no need to fear. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Okay. All right. So anytime you see an item that talks about discharge, you're talking about something that's going to happen in some, at some future event, which means, which means the contract cannot close. Now, for those of you who have been involved in traffic court and all kinds of different things going on down to the court and all those sort of things, you realize that you can go back and open up any single case if it's 100 years old. Not 100, if it's 50 years old. If you have a 50-year-old traffic ticket way back, anybody hear that old? Well, that's a few of you. <laughs> if you go back 50 years on an old case, you can reopen it. And sometimes the government does. See, it doesn't go away. So, they, so let's say, for instance, you know, the government says, okay, we pulled over so-and-so here. Let's go look at their record. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, 10 years ago, you know, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. Oh, boy, this really is a bad character. Why is that? Why can they go back 10, 12, 15 years and start drawing up information on you? And never went away. You, yeah, of course you have. You, ha you have not settled your accounts. And so if you think there's any virtue to it, you can go back actually on all, on all those accounts and settle them. Take a little bit of doing, okay. So Winston, if you set off your accounts, then they can't come back to them, are they gone? Of course. So they, if you say like whatever impaired charge, say you get one of those five years ago, you set it off, you get stopped again, they look back, 
That is not on the books? No, it's gone. Oh, no. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you can go home now. But, Get close. But, but we paid, like, it's, I've seen my record, and yeah, I couldn't believe it went back 10 years. But, on, but I paid, like, I actually paid cash for those. How come it's still on the books? You can't pay a debt. Well, you, you can't pay a debt, period. In the public, it's the adjusting of the account. It has nothing to do with payment. Now, when you go down to the clerk or whoever and start dishing out the, the paper money to them, it is not payment. It's bail. It can only be considered to be bail. Because you can't pay in the public. It's against public policy. It's against the law. <laughs> Come ahead. Now, if you got a 50-year-old case, we're all in trouble here. <laughs> no, this case is only a year old. It's oh, okay. over a year old. Uh, I, through expediency, pleaded guilty, got the whole uh, work, uh, and I've settled it. Uh, I'm supposedly free. Mm -hmm. Now, then, can I go back and get that whole case erased? Well, if it's not erased, it means you didn't settle it. How, how did you go about settlement on it? I uh, paid uh, paid back the bank six hundred bucks and and uh, and uh, then I uh, served uh, hundred hours of volunteer time and. Okay, well, we're going to go into this whole scenario here because okay. this, this is an important thing. I'm going to show you how to go back and make all them things right. Okay, thanks. You bet. All right. So, so obviously, what I'm, draw, what I'm leading up here to is that I, I do not prefer discharge. I prefer another thing we could call set-off. Now, <clears throat> set off will adjust the account to zero balance, which means it no longer exists. And that's how you get the thing taken off the books. Because if you do a set off, there is no longer any controversy. <coughs> okay, set off is kind of like this for that. And so, <clears throat> The, the, the main thing we're going to work on this weekend is to show you how to set up your bonds so that you obtain that set off. But if you do obtain the set off, then the thing goes to zero. Now, now set off is, is a bad word around attorneys. Attorneys don't want to hear anything about set off because an attorney's job is to keep the controversy rolling. And so you start talking set off to the attorneys and they're going to start going ballistic on you. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, let's start right into court so you can see how, how this thing works. And as we go to the court scenario, then we'll start to discuss some of these finer points and so forth. So let's uh, draw on this board over here. I have not seen... Uh, too, ma too awful much paperwork out of your court system, so I'll, I'll, I'll write it on the board like it appears in the United States, and you can, you can see the similarities, I hope. But, typically a court case will start out with a caption, let's call it the, uh, let's call it the Fifth District Court. Now, notice, notice how that caption is written. It's written in all capital letters, which means it is a corporation. It's a corporation. And so what kind of law can you expect to find in that court? Well, yeah, but it'll be corporate law. It will not be de jure law. It'll be corporate law, which applies only to corporate members. That's right. 
So if you go into this court right here, they're telling you, when you come through our door, here is the law that we abide by. It's our corporate law. It's based on our corporate charter, which is guaranteed by our corporate bonds. Oh, yeah, we like that idea. Okay, so. So this is how a typical case would start out up, you know, where I'm, where I'm used to. Now, invariably, <clears throat> and I say invariably, if an, attorney puts it, if an attorney puts this into the court, they will invariably bring in a uh, corporation, ABC Corp, as plaintiff. <laughs> They put the verses down here so you know it's adversarial. And then they'll say they bring in uh, Winston, which would be a bad mistake, but we'll, let's, we'll pretend like. Hey, I can't hardly get anybody to sue me these days. Anybody here want to give it a shot? Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. We'll have a lot of fun. I could, I could teach you some brand new dance steps <laughs> at the courthouse. <laughs> and then it's going to have uh, the name of the thing, you know, it's going to be a complaint for whatever, complaint for money owed, complaint for stepping on somebody's toes. It's going to have a case number. Now, when I look at something like this, I, I probably see more things there than what you see. Let me explain some of the things, and I'll explain everything I see here so you can understand how I look at this business. The key to it's right here. The key to it's right here. And that is who owns the thing. The Fifth District Court owns this. Now, some of y'all have probably run into the problem. You go into the 5th District Court, or what do you call the courts here? The Crown Courts or yeah. Provincial yeah. Courts? Yeah. Court. Queen's, Queen's, Queen's Bench. And, and, and somebody's sitting up there at the front, you know, doing a lot of talking. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they say, well, hey, stop talking because you're practicing law from the bench. Well, you're in violation. The guy that represents this party up here has to do the talking because he is the trustee. The trustee has the legal obligation to settle all the debts of the trust. Now, let me, let me explain to you. Anytime two real parties come together and have some kind of interchange, there is a resulting trust that's set up. So it's a resulting trust. By definition, so when, when the attorney or whatever comes into the corporate headquarters down here and puts in some kind of paperwork into the corporate headquarters, a resulting trust comes from that. And the party that's sitting up front with the funny outfit on is the trustee for the resulting trust, and they have the obligation to settle all the debt of the trust. That's what they're there for. And so you ought not object to them talking because they're just trying to settle, to settle the matter. That's all they're trying to do. They're trying to figure out how to get the books to reflect corporate profit. And so they're going to do that thing, so be careful how you get after them. So, but in any event, <clears throat> There's also something else with this, and I'm going to explain it to you now. And that is, is that invariably, like in the United States, it'll have the attorney's name up here on the left. So it'll be, let's say, John Smith. Uh, two, three, four, five. His address. All this kind of stuff here. You know. Sometimes. It may or may not be in capitals. But anyway, the key I want to bring to your attention is this over here. 
and that number right there, at least down in the down in the fifty down there, is his bar number, which represents his insurance policy. That's the, the prosecutor. No, it's it's the attorney who files the complaint. It might be the prosecutor in the criminal matter. In the civil matter, it'd just be the attorney for the plaintiff. But an attorney will do it right. They will bring the negotiable instrument into the court, and they will supply an insurance policy for the negotiable instrument. You see what I mean? And so in the states, and I'm, I talked to some of the guys here, the attorneys that typically don't put any kind of bar number there. Do they or don't they? No. They don't? Well, I can guarantee you they do have an insurance policy, and based upon that insurance policy, they bring this, they bring this piece of paper into the court. Now that's key right there. The attorneys are doing it right. And that is they're coming into an admiralty court with a bond. Now, how many of you have gone into court without a bond? Almost all of you. Shame on you. You never go into court without a bond. Okay, let me get over here. Call this microphone's pointing in that direction. So I could just lead what I've seen then is basically then if they come in with a bond, you could go up to them and say, well, I have my bond here. How come it's not on the record? Yeah, you can say all those things. But you got to make sure you got the bond. We'll, right. we'll, we'll go into that some more. But the reason why I wanted to... to uh, uh, feedback, won't it? The reason why I wanted to bring this to attention is because it relates directly to this problem here. And, and the word that I'm looking for here, so you understand, is subrogate. Now, get, get this in your mind. This is so important. and we, we use this. And that is, <clears throat> whoever writes the insurance policy subrogates the rights and defenses of the party for whom they write the policy. Whoever writes the insurance policy that guy's sitting on top of the heap. So whoever writes the insurance policy subrogates the rights and defenses on the instrument. Now, in the, in the lower 50 down here, the attorney's insurance policy is issued by the state. And so when an attorney puts his insurance policy number on a negotiable instrument that he takes into the court, what he has done, he has subrogated all the rights on this negotiable instrument to this corporation because this corporation is the party that actually issued the policy. And so when the, when the, when the negotiable instrument comes in, the state has the right to it. Go ahead. I just wanted to uh, just make a comment. Um in relation to the sovereign tribes, uh, a lot of this this subject matter we don't get too much into it because mm -hmm. we already have covenants already. So when we're in the courts, obviously it's it's good that uh, the bar card numbers for the um, attorneys are addressed. And quite often, as a spokesman, I don't bother doing that. I basically accept the, the uh, presumed jurisdiction of the court upon proof of claim that it does have it over Her Majesty's allies. That's correct. Um, secondly, I think um, the important thing is for people to realize that there's accepted for value in relation to how everything flows within the courts. And the simplicity of it is to realize what one code in particular means that runs the universal world of commerce and the UCC 1-207 and the UCC 1-308. 308, yeah. Invokes back to common law uh, um, all the rights as long as you mention them from the get-go before you get into the courtroom. Correct. And also, uh, therefore, it no longer puts me in air um, as an insular possession of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I so, understand that. So right from the get-go, uh, I think that's one of the things that we've had to teach the courts is in relation to the covenants already in place. So. I don't require license permits or passports wherever I travel, whether I go through 
public public pass through ports. So I think an important factor though is all about uh, um, conditions precedent already, and that everybody is free in their in their own mind. That's correct. And in accordance with 39.1 of the criminal code, basically, what is what is do people know about what that means? Really, it's your will, right, and your expression of your ideas to understand a simple formula and uh, just bring one piece of paper in. I conditionally accept this upon proof of claim we already have a contract. And I like the idea about the the lawyer and the bond right away. I accept your bond. If they're going to continue to confuse me with being a person, <laughs> then, uh, it, you know, uh, that's that's their problem now once they do that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Just don't let too many cats out of the bag. We've got a whole weekend here. we got to go over this. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he, he is in a particular situation that most of you are not, and that is he has pre-existing contracts. And some of you have those contracts in place, some of you don't. What we're hoping to show to you is you can, you can create those same kind of contracts for yourself, create your own private law, so that when you deal with the public, then you know how to do the interface and so forth. And he knows exactly how to do that. So, <clears throat> but for... All us simpletons here who are just struggling to get this information and knowledge, I'm trying to show to you how the court system works and how they take jurisdiction over you. So, by the use of insurance, the corporation subrogates all the rights and defenses on case number one, two, three, four. Now, <clears throat> what does that do for the plaintiff? It means the plaintiff has no rights and defenses. Uh, in the United States, 98% of all civil cases never get paid out to the plaintiff. Why is that? Because they're the beneficiary, not the plaintiff. <laughs> now let me explain something to you. Just get it in your mind. If you do go file a civil suit, why you would do that, I don't know. But in the event that you go file a civil suit and you come in as plaintiff, the only way that you're ever going to see any benefit from that, if you win, the only way you'll ever see any benefit from that suit is if you come in with your bond. And that's what we're trying to do, is show you how to set up so you have the appropriate bond so you can go into court. Because we, here to four, we've probably been doing it a little bit wrong. But I'm showing you the principle here of how it works down here with this corporation. They're operating on bonds. <clears throat> now, uh, as I mentioned, this whole, this whole thing we're looking at right here is just one great big negotiable instrument. That's all that it is. That's what this whole thing here is. It meets all the qualifications of a negotiable instrument. What you're probably having the most uh, hardship with is determining who the parties are on this negotiable instrument. Because negotiable instrument has certain pieces and parts to it. So let's just run through the thing for a minute here to see who all these parties are. On any negotiable instrument you have a drawer, or what's called a maker. You have a drawee. Uh, you have a payee, oh. and you have a payor. Now, well, what we got up here so far, who would you think would be the drawer? The lawyer? The lawyer. Yeah, the attorney, the guy that put it in, the guy that signed his name. So it would be, in this case here, it would be the attorney. Now, who do you think would be the draw E? What did this tell you? No, it wouldn't be the court. It would be the defendant. It would be the defendant. <laughs> now, here's, th this is really critical right here. I'm going to go into that, this in a minute. The defendant has to be the draw E. Who would be the pay E? The court. 
the courts, the payee, I mean, the, yeah, the payee, where they're getting the benefit of this negotiable instrument. Now, who do you think would be the payor? Well, at this point, you don't know. Not at this point. The reason why you don't know yet is because we don't know who the surety is for Winston over here. And remember last night we talked about that's the whole purpose of a summons. What happens when the attorney, the drawer, takes this negotiable instrument into the court and says, here, to the clerk, I have a negotiable instrument to deposit into your bank. And so the clerk looks at it and says, this is great. Who is going to pay this instrument? And the attorney says, well, I think Winston over here, I think this guy here would probably fit that bill. So why don't you go ahead and send him a summons and see if he'll come in here and be the surety. And so he sent a summons to Winston and said, hey, come on down here and talk about this. I get down and I find a holy cow, look what they got down here. They went and arrested my vessel. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to get my vessel free so they can go back into commerce? To set my ship a sail. And so they say, well, if you'll simply replace, uh, put yourself in the surety ship on this thing, we'll release your vessel back to commerce. And so most of y'all say, I'm not going to do that. Get the arguing and scrapping and going on with them, all that kind of stuff. Well, <clears throat> I personally like to be surety. Now, why do you think I would want to do a foolish thing like that? Remember, whoever creates the insurance policy subrogates all the rights and defenses. So if I come in here as surety in fact, guess what I just did? I took, a, I took the whole business to myself. It's mine now. So Winston probably in most circumstances would come back in as surety in fact. Now how do I become surety in fact? No. Keywords right there. Surety in fact. So far, look at this thing up here folks. This is all fiction, isn't it? Yep. So how would this party right here becomes surety in fact. You have to bring in evidence. Remember, one fact overcomes all fiction. And what is a fact? A fact is the agreement of the parties. Stipulations. It's what we have agreed to do. And once that information is put into the evidence in the case, now that one fact will overcome every single presumption. It will overcome every single assumption. So now we have a fact. If any of you have written to a judge and say, hey, Your Honor, uh, you made a decision over here. I want uh, uh, finding the facts and conclusions of the law. The judge write back and says, I don't have to, I don't have to do that. Why don't they have to do it? No, because there's no facts to look at. There's nothing to see. You tell a judge, hey, go look in the file and uh, look at the facts and draw conclusions of law from what you see. The judge opens up and says, hey, there ain't nothing here. I can't give you uh, facts and conclusions because there's nothing here for me to talk about. See? Because you, you haven't put anything into the evidence. So if you decide, just on some strange whim, that you would like to be the surety in fact and take control of this thing, then how are you going to do that? You're going to have to put the fact into evidence. You see what I mean? You don't because I see you all staring out here like this. <laughs> fact. Fact. Well, it could be your bond. It could be any number of things. But all I'm saying to you is, is that if you're going to become surety in fact, you're going to have to put that into the evidence file to prove it. 
Now, it, in our case, the conversation we're having here, it would be your bond. You would be wanting to put your bond into the evidence to demonstrate that you're surety in fact. Once you become surety in fact, now you control. It's, well, there's several ways to control, but this is one way. All right? I'm just sh trying to show you surety ship here because the payor down here is in fact the surety. Now, I will tell you that in the event that the clerk of the court cannot establish you as the surety, guess who the surety is? The attorney. <laughs> the attorney is the surety. Remember. Well, you know, I don't remember. But let me explain to you that any time anything like this goes into the court, it is a wagering scheme. It's a gamble. It's a bet. The attorney is betting that he can find somebody else to assume the liability other than himself. And the attorney knows going in, if he does not find surety, that he has to pay it. You understand? Okay, here comes the question. Okay. It's been suggested to me, Winston, that uh, to do something like this, for instance, to establish a fact, the procedure would be and it's been recommended to be have it done in federal court to open an evidence file and then submit your bond or your paperwork, your affidavits, what have you, establishing yourself as the surety in fact. Yeah, for that, for that vessel. Yeah. yeah, you can do that. Uh, he's talking about, uh, in states, it's called miscellaneous file. In the United States District Court, you can open up a miscellaneous file where you can put documents in as a repository. But that's, that actually does not meet the qualification for evidence in that case. You still have to bring in certified copies and, and put it into evidence. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I was helping a friend with a case, and we brought in um, used mandatory judicial notice. Uh -huh. And it was so powerful because I don't know if people know the difference, but the judicial notice, he can choose, the judge can choose to look at it or not to look at it. But mandatory judicial notice, he has to look at the facts that have been established. <clears throat> so anyway, we sent it in registered mail. And it got there on the Friday before the court case was on a Monday, and it went missing in the mail. And we got there the next morning on the Monday and asked them if they got it. They said no. And when my friend went to read it on the stand, they said, oh, no, no, we already got it. And they kicked him <laughs> off the stand. And he, the judge was shaking so much that the clipboard things were clicking together when, when he was just about to read it. So well, you fixing to lose his bond. Yeah. Well, if you'd known that, you could have you know, got his bond from him. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, now, it, what, you need to, what you need to do in all your uh, courts that you're fooling around in, if you're fooling around in courts, is you need to go and look at the evidence rules for the particular court you're dealing with. There are basically three ways to get something into evidence. Number one is, is a testimony in open court. And number two is affidavit given in open court. And number three would be a deposition. Now, on all three of those ways right there, it allows the opposition an opportunity to rebut or to cross-examine the testimony. Now, let me also tell you, uh, for those of you that don't know, is that if, if I give testimony in open court, the only way it can be rebutted is by a witness who has first-hand knowledge. An attorney cannot rebut testimony. They can't do that because anything an attorney says is hearsay. They don't have knowledge. And so, if, for instance, if you were to give testimony in open court and the, and the attorney jumped up and said, Your Honor, I object, well, you, you would tell the judge, tell that guy to stop talking. He doesn't have first-hand knowledge. Anything he says is hearsay and it's contempt of court for him to talk. Now, if he has a witness that can come in here with first-hand knowledge to rebut what I just said, that's fine. But he's not going to give testimony in this matter. He's an interloper. Tell him to shut up. Because he can't. It's contempt of court to get up there and start telling lies. And that's all he could do in that case because they wouldn't have first-hand knowledge. But in any event, uh, what I'm trying to show to you right here is in the event that you do want to be surety in fact, this is how you become surety in fact. Now one of the easiest ways to get testimony into the file is right off the floor of the court. 
And that is simply just raise your right hand to the square and say four and on the record, blah, blah, blah. Put your hand down. Any rebuttal? Do you have any first-hand witnesses that can rebut what I just said? If they can't, then it stands as the truth. Now that goes into evidence. I personally do not recommend taking the witness stand. I would rather give testimony off the floor of the court because that's where the battle is raging. If you take and put it into the witness stand, technically you're not in the court any longer. You understand the, go ahead, we have to, you have to come up here, to go, they'll get me if you don't. <laughs> That, that would be outside the bar? No, be in, in, inside in, the bar. Inside the bar. Okay. Yeah. You're not a spectator, you're a participant. Okay. Remember, you, know, you understand the four corner rule, right? If something is four cornered, it doesn't exist? Yeah. Well, go look at the courtroom, how it's set up. You got the court, let's say, right here. You got the, you got the bar here, let's say. You got the peanut gallery out here where everybody sits. You got the magistrate or judge sitting in a box, so the judge ain't there. You have the witness over here sitting in a box, so the witness is not there. Over here you have the court reporter making the official record that's not there. And in some cases, you'll have the jury box sitting over here, and they aren't there either. So now who is actually there? The plaintiff, or let's say backwards, usually the plaintiff is on this side over here. So you got the plaintiff over here, and you got the defendant right here, and they're doing battle. And there's a bailiff usually, the little bailiff is over here. So in case things get out of hand, they can draw their gun to stop it. But this is where the war goes on. This is where the court is. The court is not all the rest of this junk out here. And so if, if, if you find people here, 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 who are meddling in the battle down here, you gotta stop and say, get out of this. Me and him are doing battle over here, leave us alone. See? And so when I, I'm suggesting to you that in the event that you decide you want to give testimony in this court, I will suggest doing it down here. I will suggest doing it right here. Just throw it arms and square and say for and on the record. Blah, 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 blah. Put your hand down. Now that does go into the record. And it's not a bad idea to take your own recorder with you. Your own court reporter. Yeah, well, they, they might try to kick them out, but anyway, at the very least, record, you sit down and record everything that goes on. See what I mean? But you need to have a record of what happened, so. Anyway, uh, any questions about putting evidence into a court? It's got five minutes. Okay, go ahead and change the tape. Okay, we're back live again. So, uh. To continue on with what we were talking about. But what I was just trying to do was set you up so you understood how you prove that you're the surety in fact by putting it into evidence. Then I showed you the methodology that you can use to put something into the evidence file in the court so it becomes a part of the official record and so forth. Now, uh, the court has a public and a private side. And what's in the clerk's file is on the public side, and what's in the judge's side of the file is on the private side. And so many times you think you're, you're putting evidence in, but putting things in on the public side, but it's just not so. When you put stuff into the public, uh, it is not evidence. Even if you put it over here as an affidavit, it's not evidence. It has to go into the private side over here, which is the judge's file. A lot of people have made that mistake. It's my understanding that a judge on the bench cannot bring the private into the public. Is that correct? 
No, a banker can convert. <laughs> banker has license to do conversion. And so the judge can, in fact, bring things back and forth. See what I mean? Okay. Well, let's go back to this negotiable instrument over here. Uh, go ahead. Quick question. So an affidavit put into the court or in advance set into the record of the court is not necessarily evidence. No. Even it's, if it's an uncontested affidavit which is considered fact by, by commerce. It's considered fact by you. But how does the bank see it? They can't. They don't. They don't see it yet. You mean see, it's not coming into the court, so they don't have to. Well, you come in for the private right? side, saying I have an affidavit over here that's uncontested, yeah. and they say prove it. No, it's in the UCC, uh, an, an affidavit. Sorry, you can't bring UCC into my court here. That's private law. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> well, Sorry, let me let, let me help you out that a little bit. <clears throat> If you don't give the other party opportunity to cross-examine, it is denial of due process to them. You have to give due process to the other party by giving them the chance to rebut your affidavit. If you don't, it can't go into evidence. It'll stay out here in the public until you do. And so, even though you have, from, from your world, you're bringing in a foreign judgment you got notaries on it. You got protests. You got all this kind of stuff going on on your document right here. And you bring it into the court, and the court says, so what? You haven't given the other party due process yet, and so we can't see it because we do not want to go and injure the other party. The court won't injure the other party, regardless of what you do. So you have to give the other party due process. Okay. What about when the court starts and they go for jurisdiction? I mean, do they have jurisdiction over you at this time? At what time? Well, when it starts, like you're, you're the... Are you you're talking the, about a civil matter, a criminal matter? Any matter. They ask you your name and they call, call you up there and they want you're the all caps guy, so they, they got jurisdiction over you or something. Well, what, how does the, then you're beat before you start. No, you're not. Remember what that banker said? I got a bond. I can break the law. We're, trying, we're, we're building up this bond stuff, and the, probably the bond thing will probably answer a lot of your questions for you, but okay. How do you get stuff into the court file when the clerk won't uh, take it? Yeah. Let's see. Let me think for a minute. Does the clerk have a bond? <laughs> and if they don't obey their bond, what will I do? Mm -hmm. I'll seize it or accept it like some have said. Okay. If you have a notary deposition that you've entered into the court and it's not looked at by the judge? Well, first off, on the notary deposition, was the other party notified? Yes. Okay. And they chose not to attend. All right. Well, then you need to get after that judge for his bond because he cannot avoid that. Because you have to understand that a notary is senior to a judge. When the notary comes in with documents and the judge refuses to look at it, he's got a problem. Okay. A friend of mine in southeast Saskatchewan was in court a few weeks ago, maybe more than a month or so ago. And uh, CRA, Canadian Revenue Agency, had brought him in for failure to file. Uh -huh. And they had, they brought in their witnesses and the judge did not allow him to cross-examine these witnesses. Okay. It's his bond and him that they got to go after, is it? Yeah, because that, that right there is violation of his due process. Thank you. That is a, that is a major no-no for a judge to deny due process. Okay. Okay. Um, when the... Uh, how do you access the judge's bond? Yes. 
How do you get it? How do you capture it? Acceptance value, you said, sure, but how does that bring it into? Well, I'll show you that technology right. how I would prefer to do it, and we'll, we'll go over that. Uh, before, we're over, before we're through here, you're going to see a lot of interesting things. <laughs> you remember it now? Yeah, yeah, remember. You're sure of yeah, it. Okay. okay, now, when you're, you said you, you have to give the other chance, uh, party due process. Uh -huh. Now, if you already got them in a judgment and a stopple, and they, doesn't they have already waived their right to... to so, that is due process. Okay, so when I put it into the file, do I, I don't have to notice them again at that point? Okay, what you did out here in the private is one thing. You got them into an estoppel over here. So now you're bringing your foreign judgment into a new venue. So when you get into the new venue, you say to the court, I want to put this into evidence. Then they, they have to give the other party due process in that venue, and, and, the, and the, the judge will simply ask them, did you answer this thing or not? You're going to say, no, okay, you got your due process into evidence it goes. Okay, but that won't be until a hearing. They won't go ahead once you put it in, and then you won't write to the They have to have a hearing. Okay. They have to have the opportunity to go on the record. Right. Uh-huh. Okay, so I, I made affidavits, um, and uh, I have a default judgment on my ongoing case. Okay. Um, my, uh, my friend and I, Tim, that you spoke with, we tried many times to go down to the clerk to try to get it into the file. But what we ended up doing was giving it all to the prosecutor directly, to the prosecutor's office. Uh-huh. Is, are they, uh, like, they have it. There's no question that they have all those documents. Do they have to put it in the file, or can they just, what's their obligation now? Because they've been, I notified them directly. Well, they have no obligation to you. What would obligate them to you? Well, I just assume that if they have public documents notarized, that they would have to put it in the file. No. So they could just pretend to ignore it? Of course. Okay, does, does it give me any remedy that I have served them, though, with those documents? Oh, I think you ought to go back and you know, get, it, get it done the right way. Okay. Don't, don't rely upon an attorney to help you out because why should they? You know, they're, they're trying to take money from you, not give it to you. So, uh, no, but it, if, if you choose to fool around in the court, I'm all explaining to you is do it the right way and then you'll get the results that you want from it. Now, one, like I say, one of the things that we do to get it done the right way is we, we take discretion away from the, the judge. And the way we take discretion away from him. See, the guy sitting up front, you think is a judge. He's not a judge. He's a, a chancellor. He's an administrator. He's a, he's a corporate flunky. And he does not fall under the jurisdiction of the de jure law. Now, you can't, you can't put him into that situation. Now, remember... <clears throat> When I, when I drew you those, those steps the other day, remember we drew the, uh, we drew the diagram with the, uh, with the Levitical. We said it was made without an oath. And then we went into the Melchizedek. With, with an oath. Now, it is possible for one man to have both of those offices. A man can have Melchizedek priesthood and he can have Levitical priesthood all at the same time. You see it in the courtroom all the time. You have a man sitting there who's acting in the capacity of a Levite without an oath he also has capacity as of Melchizedek with an oath. It's just that you're having a hard time invoking this side of the equation with them because they're operating over here in the public without an oath. Now, one of the, one of the, one of the ways that you can do is you can go down to the, to the archivist or the, or the custodian of the records and you can get a certified copy of their oath of office and their bond. And you can enter that into evidence. Same way you enter anything else into evidence. 
or you can do it right in open court like we've done before. Simply ask the guy sitting up front, do you have an oath of office? And I did this. I asked the guy, we got to fiddling around. And I said, I said, do you have an oath of office? He said, yes. And I said, well, is it in the courtroom here today? And he said, no. I said, but you're, you do say you have one. See, now I'm getting, in, I'm getting him to testify. Remember, whoever gives the testimony is the debtor in that relationship. So he said, yes, I do have one. I do have one. I said, very good. I said, the court takes judicial notice of the oath of office of John Smith. Now he started doing a tap dance. He was trying everything in this world he could do to get away from that because he did not want the court to take judicial notice of his oath of office. Now, when I find I said, I said, are you going to do it or not? He said, okay. He said, I will. So the court did take judicial notice of his oath of office, which made him what? It made him a judge. Now, a judge is neutral. And so, in essence, what I did was, I busted the trust because now all of a sudden the trustee is neutral in this matter. He can't raise the issues. He can't, he can't talk. And every time that guy would try to say anything, I'd say, stop, you're on your oath. And he finally sat back and put his hand just shut up. So me and the attorney went after it then, see. But my point, my point I'm trying to bring to you here is that you can neutralize the man up front by simply putting him on his oath, either by bringing in certified copies and putting it into evidence, or just verbally, right there on the spot, getting him, getting the court to take judicial notice of his oath of office. And so once you've done that, now all of a sudden, uh, you're not fighting against, it's not, it's not a tag team match against you anymore, just going one-on-one -on -one with the attorney, okay? So if you're able to do that then, um, especially in certain circumstances when they're, they're bringing a person in and they want to represent themselves. Um, they, uh, once you put that judge, you, you've brought that evidence in, they basically can't say anything then, right? The only thing, at that point, they are only referees. That's all they are. Okay. They can't practice law from the bench. So they can't like, start directing the individual to do this no, or that? No, I'll tell you, the war's between me and the attorney now. I mean, he can sit there and, and call fair play. That's all he can do. But what about if the attorney says you know, another individual has no right to speak or anything like that? Like who's, who's the, is, that, is that still the judge actually refereeing? So you don't, have any, you don't have a right to speak in my court or anything like that? Okay, now I'm not sure I'm following your question here. Oh, okay. Well, it's, if there's a, if a, if a, what do you call it, the defendant has individuals that, they want to have talk for them. Uh huh. Oh, okay. you mean as counsel? Yeah. Or as witnesses? Uh, counsel. Counsel. Okay. Okay. But the judge, his previous, would have said, "Well, no, you don't have a right to talk in my court." Well, now he doesn't have a right to say anything. You better not say anything. I'll have his. I'll have his bond. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> it's all about bonding, folks. How do you take his bond? Well, we're going. To, we're going to go with how you take his bond. But remember, you know, Not that he really cares. huh? Not that he really cares. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get all that taken care of. We're kind of, you know, we're kind of just trying to build up a little momentum here. So, so when we finally get to bonding, you all be excited and say, Whew, we finally got there. Do you have to have the actual uh, judge's oath, the, his personal? Because we have it, uh, it's in an act where they all have to say the same oath. Is that enough? To, is that strong enough to get into evidence? Uh, are you saying that, that they have a collective oath that they don't have a separate oath? The collective That's is fine. Like it's in one of our acts where it just says, uh, I blank, do swear, and blah, 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 blah. Okay. That, is that strong enough to get in there? Yeah. Well, I, what I would do in that case, I would go to the archivist and ask the archivist for a certification of that uh, act. Okay. And then you, then you could very well bring that act right into open court and say, Your Honor, have you sworn an oath under this act? And they say yes. Well, then the court takes judicial notice of, of that fact. But see, well, you're, you're, trying to get, you're trying to get away from all this business down here where the, where the court has discretion. 
You remember in the old in the Old Testament times, a Levitical priest made his living from his occupation. A Levitical priest made his living from his occupation. In other words, he got a part of the sacrifice. See? Now, this here goes this here goes for free. He doesn't get paid for this. And this is where you can always trip them up. Have you ever gone into court and say, Your Honor, did you get a paycheck last week? Sure did. Well, does your employer certify you in your occupation? Well, yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't pay me. Does your employer pay you to tell lies? No. Well, have you revealed all the material facts in this matter? <laughs> Somebody got problems. Because <laughs> now you're going to go seize his paycheck. Go ahead. Well, RCMP in Canada swear an oath for peace officers, not law enforcement officers. So anytime they stop you for anything, they're breaking their oath. Of course. How do we get them not to break their oath? Same Can we thing. take their bond by simply saying, you're stopping me for speeding, there's no third party allowed here, I'm taking your oath. I'm taking your bond. I wouldn't tell them that right there on the spot because they do have guns. <laughs> I, would go, I would go and do it otherwise, and we're going to show you how to do because it otherwise. It, technically speaking, if you go to court for anything that's not a third party taking you to court, they've already broken their oath. Yeah. Instantly. They're, tr they're trying to make their living at being a peace officer. But, but if they swore the oath and every job they go out to do is breaking their oath, why do they swear that oath in the first place? I don't know why they do it. They're required. Yeah. Well, yeah, they are required as officers and so forth. But, but who, if, if someone's requiring them to swear that oath, then they give them the books, here's your rule book now, now go break them. I agree with you that it's morally wrong what they're doing. I agree that it's morally wrong. But they're doing it, and so now you do, have, do you have a remedy? And the answer is yes, you do have a remedy. And that's what we've spent, so that's, that's what we're here for. Fact, do the paperwork to try to take their bonds? Or Don't try to. Bond? Do it. Because also they have coupons to bond too. Isn't there, isn't there a master bond and then coupons on the master bond? I, and they can just rip a little coupon off and give it to you? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. So not, I don't know the answer to that. If you seize a bond from a police officer or a judge, is he gone? Okay, no job? First, first off, I don't seize anything personally. I have a third party do the seizure. What they do with the thing after that, I don't care. Do they lose their job afterwards? They very well could. If they're not, if they're not bondable, they can't, they, can't, they can't insure them. Now, they, they try to get away, with, get away from that by being called, what's called self-insured. But that, they still have underwriters, so you go after the underwriters. Okay. You said they, the uh, Melchizedek priesthood doesn't get paid, but didn't Melchizedek get a tithe from Abraham when, when he appeared? Yeah, he did, but what I was trying to explain to you here that, that he does not make his living at that. Okay. The tenth part belonged to the Lord. Now, if you go back in the Old Testament history, you'll find out that that tenth part, actually only one, one part of that was for the use of the priesthood, and the other part paid the civil government. It was a tax, and so the, the, the tithe, as it was, was more for the civil government, for the, raising the armies, and building the roads, and all that kind of thing. In the Levitical, but what about the Melchizedek one? That's what I'm trying to explain to you. The Melchizedek priesthood is, is, made, is, is not a paid position. Now, it is true that Melchizedek collected from Abraham from the spoils of war, right. so forth and so on, but I don't think Melchizedek used it for his support. No. Whereas the Levitical priests could, they made their living at it, and that's why they had the discretion. Okay, where are we going with all this now? I'm trying to think where I'm going with all this. Try to figure it out. Well, let's see here. Huh? Yeah, yeah you're, trying to, you're trying, trying to take discretion away from the guy sitting up front. And the only way you can do that is either either to put him under his bond or give him a bond. 
Now, we've kind of joked about, joked around about this in the past, but it's a valid, it's a valid thing to do. Remember, whoever writes the insurance policy slash bond subrogates the rights and defenses of the party whom they bond. So whoever, whoever bonded this judge over here, they're the, ones that, they're the ones that call the tune. Now, what if I go and bond this party, the judge over here? Yeah, and what kind of bond does Winston like to bring in? Unlimited bond. And so my bond is going to be bigger than their bond. And my bond came out of the private side. So I just, I just pulled a trump card on them. See what I mean? So now, <clears throat> so now that I have bonded the guy sitting up front, and he has noticed, he has knowledge that I have done that thing. When I tell him to jump, he better say how high on the way up. <laughs> he better. Because if he does not, if he dishonors me, and I'm the guy that wrote the insurance policy, what do you think I will do with that insurance policy? I'll liquidate it. I'll liquidate the bond that just wrote for him. Anybody, anybody here have an idea of what the what the judge's bond is in the probably in this area right here, the judge's bond might be as high as a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand. Actually the bonds aren't that high. And so if I if I go right out of three hundred million in indemnity bond and put it into the treasury for on behalf of Judge So and so over here. And I go and liquidate the full three hundred million. What's that going to do to his one hundred fifty dollar bond, one hundred fifty thousand dollar bond? I'm going to suck it right up. Something bad's fixing to happen. Now, <clears throat> if somebody cannot, if somebody is unbondable, how many of y'all lost your insurance? The insurance company says, "Hey, we can't insure you. You had too many wrecks." Anybody here in that category? Don't lie now. Don't lie. <laughs> well, it's the same thing here. If, if, if an insurance underwriter comes along and says to a public official, hey, you have gotten too many claims against you. We cannot bond you. We've had to pay out too many uh, claims. Therefore, we cannot give you a bond. Now, if the guy decides, well, I'm going to go ahead and sit on the, on the judgment seat anyway, guess what he, guess what, where the liability lies? Privately his private assets. See what I mean? Now, do, do, you, do you want to risk your house, your car, you know, the family pet and all that kind of stuff? If you do, go right ahead. But I suggest to you probably that they would not. Would you? There ain't enough money. He'd go back into private practice or something like that, but he's not going to sit on the, on, the, on the judgment seat and have to risk the family home. What would happen if his wife found out about that? He wouldn't be sleeping on the couch. He'd probably be buried with the couch. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm telling you. So. So 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 you see why I like to operate in commerce. And we we have we've been we've been struggling with this stuff. We've been fighting and carrying on with it. And I think we pretty much got a lot of the kinks and bugs ironed out. But uh, I prefer commerce above anything else because I find that's where the remedies are. I find out that's how I can access, you know, the things I want to get into. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and uh, take a uh, 10 or 15 minute break. We'll come back here in about 10 or 15 minutes and uh, start again. <laughs> I got to tell you that uh, <clears throat> I haven't always been doing this seminar stuff. I used to be a construction worker. And when I go out here and see all these guys doing this work and everything, it kind of makes me homesick. Too old and broke up to do it now, but I used to really enjoy that kind of thing. And I always figured if I didn't have a day's work done by 10 o'clock in the morning, I wasn't going to get it. And so I uh, kind of press you for getting moving here and getting things done. So uh, we'll keep it up. All right, uh, there were some questions asked 
about some of the problems you're having with notary service. And I was going to ask uh, Burke, if you're awake back there, can you tell the guys how to solve some of their notary stuff? Or would you care to? <laughs> how, how, what, what have you done to solve some of the problems with the notary stuff you have in here? We, we don't have that problem in the States. It might be a notary down there. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention on that over there, uh, when you pop file or a complaint or a document is filed in the court, especially uh -huh. in civil matter, I don't know sure about this province, but other provinces, the back page is blue. Mm -hmm. And on the bottom right corner, it has the attorney's name, address, and bar card number. Whoa, okay, there you so, go. Say it again. <laughs> when a complaint goes in in a civil matter, again, they make it a four-corner document, so you have all the between verses, right? And yeah. then on a back page, it has to be a blue page. It has to be bound. Back page has to be blue. And I'm guessing it might have something to do with Admiralty. <laughs> and the bottom right corner, it has the solicitor's name, address, fax, phone, and LSUC number. Well, that's Lost Society of Upper Canada. So I'm here, I'm guessing they have the BC bar. And they'll have their Lost Society number on there, which is obviously their bond. Okay. And I'm sure, is the back page is blue here? Anybody ever been yeah. served? Yeah. There you go. So it's the same process. And yeah, what we have is always in a criminal matter, it's always Her Majesty or Regina, or Regina means the sovereign, versus. And then again, it's the Crown prosecuting. So it's really the Queen's Bank that's coming after. Um, notary problems. What, what do you want to know? Some of the guys said they were having some problem getting things notarized. Uh, the notary like, won't do it here sometimes, unless you tell them. One of the things we always do, first of all, is um, when the document's prepared, we put notice. Um, the use of a notary is for verification of signature only and has, it creates no adhesion to the contract and then underneath we put the jurat because if you don't do that in Ontario, in Ontario I'm not sure if it's the same thing here but we ha you, have to be a, you have to be a lawyer to be a notary and that makes it very difficult to find somebody willing to do it and what the first thing they'll do is they'll want to take the paperwork and read it to see if they can sign it we just flip right to the back page, you know what, you've got nothing to do with this other than to say I'm me and the trick that they always do is they go, okay, well, give me your driver's license. They'll always want to make a photocopy. I don't have a problem with them making a photocopy myself because if they've got it on file, right, that's great. Good. You want to see it? Go see the lawyer, right? Um, but what they usually want to do is see some ID and they'll start writing down your driver's license number or something. Now, if you come in and say, I want to sign this, and then they take down your driver's license number, who really signed it? It wasn't you anymore. So one of the things that we've done is we've gone out of state, we've gone out of province and gone to the states. We found a U.S. notary because they're not lawyers down there, they're just a fee for hire. Um, I will come back later and give you an address of some people we found in the states that will do full notarial protests and all that down. Well, we have notor notaries that do that in Canada the same way. Well, I thought that's why I'm here because you couldn't find notaries. Well, that's some of them, some have <laughs> said they've had problems with notary okay. service. So what we've done is uh, just found a U.S. notary, and what we'll do here is uh, one of the documents we sent back came back, sent out, came back because it wasn't duly authorized. Now, when you go to a bank with a negotiable instrument, they look at you, you show them your ID if they don't know you, and they'll turn it over and stamp it. And everybody knows that every bank employee is a notary. There was an incident here where the janitor was cleaning the bank at night, <laughs> notarizing documents during the day, because <laughs> every bank employee is a notary. And really? ever since then, they outsource cleaning services. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when, when you go to the counter and lay down your negotiable instrument, you autograph it, you endorse it, the bank flips it over and stamps it, the notary just witnessed your signature. And that's what's happening at a bank. Um, I forget where I was going with that train, too. It's contagious. <laughs> um, but what we do, I guess, we found a foreign notary to be the acceptor in a different jurisdiction because the law society can't come after them. We have notaries that are willing to do stuff, and they usually get a phone call from the law society. They get all bent out of shape. So what we've done is we've just, oh, yeah, the duly authorized. Sorry, I'll get back on the train. Okay. <laughs> um, we sent out something that came back. We can't do this because this is not duly authorized. Now, you know, is it birth or is it birth? Is it duly or is it duly? Well, a notary signature counts as two signatures, and that's why, because he's signing as the pastor between the private and the public. So he's, his autograph witnessing your signature is in two capacities. You can just get two people witnessing your signature, and it has the same effect because it is duly authorized. So um, when I do a presentment, 
when I used to do presentments, because I'm no longer in business, but back in the days, we used to just go do the paperwork and uh, do verification and send it. Like, we don't use the word witness because then we're testifying. So we do, you know, autograph. We don't sign because the person signs. We autograph things. So you autograph and you get two verifications of the autograph. So two people will verify the autograph. It goes out with the return address to the notary in the States. So what we'll do is we'll send it out, get the delivery receipt. So here's the presentment, here's a delivery receipt that they have received it. Um, and included in there also is a, a list of contents. So here's the presentment, here's a list of contents, and here's the envelope it got mailed in. Here's the proof that it got received by the end user. Then we ship that all to the notary so he has proof or, you know, first-hand knowledge or has been advised of the same beliefs to be true and correct that this presentment has gone out. And then from there, the notary in the States can issue the non-response. So that's a really simple, cheap, easy way to do it is just get two friends to witness the autograph. Um, other than that, walk in there with a contract. What, I've done that before. I walked in uh, to the lawyer's office. First thing I do is say, you're a notary? Yeah, okay, here's what I want. I'm coming to you in your private or in your capacity as a notary only because all lawyers have two seals, one for the lawyer and one for the bar, or sorry, one for the bar and one for the notary. And you say, I want no legal advice. No legal advice will be ever um, requested or issued or received or accepted. So you got to indemnify him and indemnify you. So I don't care what you're telling me. It's not going to be received as legal advice by me and you can't give it and I'm not going to ask you for it. So you just create this little contract that totally indemnifies him ahead of time. And then you get him to sign it, and then you sign it. And if you have witnesses, you get two witnesses to sign it. And good, you leave him a copy, and you take a copy. So now the lawyer will never be on the hook uh, for legal advice. And that makes them feel a lot more comfortable, because if they, especially when you start sending stuff to banks and that, they usually get a call from the law society, hey, what are you doing? Smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had a lot of notaries been attacked for that, just because they're sending out paperwork, and then the law society gets all bent out of shape. And we have notaries that are not part of the bar in other provinces we've used, and they still get attacked from the from the law society saying you're handing out legal advice to these people, and and all what it says is return address to notary acceptor, and and that constitutes legal advice. So there's a bunch of things that you have to do, well, you could do, to protect yourself. All right. So did you have a question for him? Yeah, it's just the, the on that, um, and we've done that also with uh, making use of a notary. Um, and yes, they have come back and well, they have said us right, right there. We're trying to get them uh, to witness our signature, and they won't because um, they try and look, look through it. And it says right on there, as you said, uh, you know, it could be indemnifies you, but they still want to take a look through. It. Well, we can't. I can't do this. And I said, well, what can't you do? You're witnessing my signature. Um, and we've run into some problems with some notaries that they don't want to do that. And yeah, I write. They have the bar has come back at some people and said, I don't know, it's like a, this. They want to blanket these notaries from doing any help to the people that want to do the work we do. Um, and getting a notary, to be a notary, as far as I know, mm -hmm. and Keith can back me up on this. Um, uh, with our group, we, a person did get their, their notary seal. It didn't cost a whole heck of a lot, did it? 250 bucks. Um, and I was, I was amazed. I said, well, I said, it's a Burke... Uh, Burke, obviously, is his name also. Um, like, what did you have to do for schooling? He says, well, I got this book, and I had to read it, and that's about it. I thought, mm -hmm. you're kidding. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering, well, is it that easy? Is that the same thing? I don't know. That's what happened in Saskatchewan anyway. We had to be lawyers. In Ontario, you have to be a lawyer. Okay, well, in uh, Saskatchewan, I don't know if it's in B.C., but in Saskatchewan, that's, that's all I get. We got a book and fly at it, you know. They make Sorry. exceptions if there's no lawyers in your area that can be a notary, then you can apply, but unfortunately they're everywhere. <laughs> well, but but what I, the point I want to make was, if maybe um, to, to Winston, is if the notary is uh, objecting to do, his, do their job, can, is there any remedy for that? Yeah. And plus, if, a bond. And plus, if the, uh, the bar, uh, the legal society, is disrupting the notary from doing their duty, can you also go after them? Yeah, they're a corporation too. Oh, okay. You want to ask him? Uh, no, I, actually, I got some information about the notary uh, okay. in BC. Um, oh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I live in Campbell River on Vancouver Island, and 
a bunch of years ago when I was starting to do this stuff, they shut down all the notaries in town on us. One day a friend and I were walking through town and they were putting up back in five minute signs on every lawyer door and every notary <laughs> door. So um, what we did is we found out in Washington State uh, all you need is three credible witnesses, uh, a green card uh, and a business residence down there and you can create your own notary out of Washington State for about five to seven hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we did that and uh, the problem was of course getting into Washington State all the time and especially if you know you're, you're wanted on a warrant or something and you can't get into the states so we found a little loophole in that and that is that we phoned up the Washington State Notary Society and asked if we can notarize documents in Washington State waters and they said yes as long as it's in within Washington State so I said great and then the BC ferries of course runs for half an hour through American waters on the way to Tawaston from Victoria as well you can also um, drive a, a pleasure craft into Washington State waters going through that triangle as long as you do not drop anchor so you can also record into your logbook on a on a boat, a commercial boat, that you did that there too. That works. Plus, also, I've talked to a freighter captain who says you can go 12 miles offshore and write it into the logbook, and it's a notarized document. Anyway, if he does it, and he has to have the stamp with the vessel registration number and the name of the vessel on it. That's the crimp stamp. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, the in BC, you can uh, become a notary if you're not in a present notarial district. And, and uh, you have to be residing outside a district. I found Campbell River and Courtney, um, there was an area in between the two um, communities that was, wasn't within a notarial district or electoral district. And um, if you live there, you can apply with the uh, council, uh, approval of the council through the governor general and be appointed a notary. Well, I tried that and they just gave me a runaround. I didn't really hold them down to it, but they did write me back and say, you know, good luck on your venture. We forwarded it to the uh, council office, right? But that was it. So, anyway. I just had a quick question about notaries and commissioner votes. How close are they connected? Um, is one important as the other? Um, that's another thing. That's another thing that we've looked at. Uh, the, def the legal definition we've found of a commissioner is a diplomatic envoy between sovereign states. And we thought, well, do we really want the lawyer to be signing this or a diplomatic envoy to take it to the private and the public? And I don't see a problem because it's, it's fully acceptable in the courts, out our way anyway, I've got to be sure. And it's the same here. And the other thing is that a notary in Ontario also doesn't need a seal, just needs an autograph. So there's a lot of things that you can do to, to make it simpler for them. But uh, I don't see a problem with, it doesn't matter, it just has to be verified the oath. And it's not, remember that when you do this things, you're just creating an affidavit. And the affidavit doesn't mean as much as the non-response. It means they've accepted everything, and that's where you want the bonded autograph. So use a notary, use two signatures, use a commissioner. Courthouses always have them. Uh, they generally don't want to sign stuff out our way, unless it's court-related. But it's a non-response that always does it. So just find somebody in the state side that'll do it. And a neighboring state is just, they can't touch it. It's international, they're bonded, and it's, it, it creates an international incident. It's really a foreign judgment now if somebody in the U.S. does it. So it just made everything simpler for us to do it that way. All right, there you go. All right. Just uh, added a little tidbit of information. Every MP, every MLA is also by default a notary. That's why I went about accepting the oath of office in hard copy of Cindy Hawkins, who is the MLA in this area. I'm going to make a quick comment on the oath of office. You can go to the internet and print up, like somebody mentioned before, it's on the internet, the oath of office. Um, a friend of mine had a great idea, just print it off, handwrite their name, accept it for value, and send it to them, see if they disagree. And if they don't disagree, <laughs> within three days they've accepted that you've accepted their oath. Right? It's just... Rather than go and chase it down and get certified copies, just print it off, hand write their name in, and it makes it <laughs> okay. so simple. Right? All right. Fair enough. Go ahead. Oh, Burke. Uh, oh. Just, I was, we were just trying to get some stuff notarized in Calgary, uh, specifically about getting it, you know, mailed back to them as a, you know, like as a cert for, for a certification yeah. of, uh, of non-response. And he wouldn't do it because he thought he'd get him in trouble. And he handed, he handed me what they got. Uh, mailed or you know issued and stuff uh, so I said I so I asked him instead of you know saying do this do that I said what would be the remedy that you would suggest and he suggested that well what I can do is I can notarize an affidavit that this is a, a, a note like a 
basis of non-response. Yeah. If you put it in affidavit form, he'll notarize that. Yeah, yeah, and that's one remedy that's been. Ex ex one lawyer said to us they didn't want to be the notary acceptor. They didn't want to do this whole thing. They said my affidavit, your affidavit, is just as powerful as mine. Why don't you just say, well, I told them to mail it to him. I went down to him and he didn't have it for me, and I swear they didn't respond. It's just it, it doesn't matter who signs the non-response really, as long as it's a bonded signature on the bottom of the page, that certifies there is no response to the presentment, and that's been told to us too. Just do it yourself. Yeah. But he still needs a notary, right? So. Um, just a little bit of information about the notary. Uh, I happen to uh, know of a notary uh, from Washington State. Um, as, as you can appreciate, is an expression of an idea. Uh, of uh, a place, I guess. So when you when you really think about, you know, notaries in general, uh, when you think about Washington State, you're probably thinking about Washington State on the map, right? So you got to remember everything's expressions of ideas. Um, I know that I've utilized uh, the bank at Wells Fargo, and I noticed he had a notary seal up there, and I happened to need I needed something over on state side, what they call Washington State, I said, hey, uh, can you do me a favor here? I got doing business with you here with my person here, and uh, I need this notarized. Happened to be a license, right, which I already captured already with a stamp and everything, and took the, and had them notarize a document, which then enabled me to, for my person to have a, a notary ship by appointment from the tribe. So that's how I did it, because uh, uh, there's always ways around things if you kind of have a, you know, uh, the, the will, the free will connected. And uh, initially then, when I got that, well, he can't witness his own signature, so I went to the other Wells Fargo down to Nask. It was about 13 miles away. I said, can you do me a favor here? I forgot to ask the guy up in Wells Fargo or at Orville uh, to notarize this as a certified true copy of this copy. And I had a registered mail on it, and then I shipped it off, and uh, I shipped off a check with it as well from the bank. They cashed it, so we have a contract and a blue <laughs> signature form. And then Washington State got a hold of me and said, hey, what's the problem? You guys cashed a check. We got a contract. I'm still waiting for the license for my person. <laughs> oh, we do bulk mails and everything like this. We'll get it to you on Friday. Sorry about that. And So it's all about knowing who one is and what, what you're doing. <laughs> But I kind of set it up so that uh, you have to have this your social security number or somebody said an alien status card of some nature. But it's just about thinking about you could do anything with these documents. And the notary uh, obviously uh, became appointed, not by commission. And therefore, uh, um, this does a bit of work in the public once in a while. Yep, folks are more than one by the skin of cat. You've heard several ways to skin that poor cat. 